participate, should come forward and be involved. I'm going to ask everyone to pick up your chair and bring it such that we have a circle of chairs only with those. I have a big circle with a bunch of those chairs. So anyone who wants to participate, bring your chair and let's make a circle out of it. And, and Lauren was like, Maybe, do you want to take it off? And I'm like, no. I, somebody asked me. I'll just tell them all about it. It's good advertising. <laughs> and I'm not going to make any anything that they don't want to do. Um, is everyone feeling good? Yeah. Feeling comfortable? If not, make yourself comfortable. Is everyone comfortable? Let's all slide our chair back about six inches. <laughs> And uh, I'll talk a little bit first. My name is Misha Tuesday. I, in 2016, I took a formal course to train in hypnosis. And the most interesting bit about that is how I got buy-in from my wife to spend $2,000 on a hypnosis course. I had been a professional magician at the time for several years. I had been listening to a podcast about hypnosis, which I had always been interested in, never really did anything about it, and I was like, I should go train with this, this guy. He has a training course. He sounds like he knows what he's talking about. I'm going to go do it. I said to my wife, I would like to go take this training course. She's like, how much is it? Well, you know what? You've been really focused on magic. I think this is shiny object syndrome. You should stick with what you're doing. I'm like, OK, honey, that makes sense. Then a couple days later, we watched the Netflix documentary on Tony Robbins. And in case anyone doesn't know Tony Robbins, he is a uh, self-improvement, high-performance, guru type, you know, personal power guru type of figure uh, who does these seminars, and he is also trained in Ericksonian hypnosis. At one point in the documentary, hi there, pull up a chair and let's like make some room uh, for our new uh, And so we're watching this documentary, and Tony Robbins has this guy in the audience who's kind of like sheepish and meek, and he's you know trying to impress his fiance, and his fiance is like just by her posture, you can tell like she's the power figure in the couple, and she's kind of like you know not you know having second thoughts about this relationship because he's kind of like a meek kind of guy. And Tony Robbins tells this metaphorical story using hypno conversational hypnosis to essentially turn this guy from a, a lamb into a lion. He tells a story about a lion raised by lambs who thinks it's a lamb, and the big lion, and Tony Robbins is big. He's like, the big lion took a hunk of mutton and put it down the, the little lion's throat, and here he actually goes up to the guy, may I touch your chest, Matt? Sure. He goes up to the guy and he says, he forced it down the guy's throat, and he just rubs his thumb a little bit there like the, like the mutton is going down. and. And you can see this guy the whole time listening to the story, and like his his posture is changing, and he's getting like this confident look in his eyes. And Tony Robbins says, "Now roar like the lion you are," and he roars into the microphone, and his sound people, of course, are putting on like echo and stuff, so it like reverberates throughout the the, um, the auditorium. And then they cut to the next day. It's outside of the auditorium, and they're and they're look, talking to this couple. And there's a huge boulder. It's one of those buildings that has, like, when they were digging the foundation, they found a huge rock, and they have it there as a decoration. He is standing up on the rock talking to some people like they, that they know. And she is standing next to the rock looking up to him. And you can tell that she's just like, this is my man, you know? Yeah. And as soon as that little segment got done, the documentary's not over, but she turns to me and she says, you know, I've been thinking about the hypnosis course, and I think you should do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So I went to train in Toronto with a Canadian hypnotist named Mike Mandel, who is also an NLP trainer. NLP stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming, um, which is a set of tools. Uh, I might say it's a set of um, assumptions more so than tools. Tools come out of it, but it is um, a way of producing tools more so. But the premise of Neuro Linguistic Programming is that the language you use to construct your thoughts and the way you represent the world internally has a huge impact on your experience of the world. And so the premise of NLP is that 
if you change the language you're using to describe your experience to yourself and you change your representation of the world that has a measurable impact on your experience and your behavior. So it is a way, is it another method of behavioral change. Um, and the hypnosis can be a lot of things, but one of the things that it's most often used for is for behavior change. Um, so my teacher, Mike Mandel, because he is also an NLP trainer, and NLP, you might say, is a superset of hypnosis. To create NLP, uh, John Grinder and Richard Bandler interviewed extensively three very well-known at the time um, successful therapists and, and teachers of therapy, which were Virginia Satir, Fritz Perls, and Milton Erickson. Um, and they interviewed these people and observed like their, uh, you know, with permission of the patients, of course, observed their interactions with patients. And one of them was a linguist and one of them was a psychologist, the uh, Bandler and Grinder who started NLP. And they basically broke down the language patterns, broke down the ways that these therapists were able to um, help their patients just change how they were describing their experience to themselves internally, having wonderful breakthrough results. And so they came up with NLP as um, a collection of how to do that. And because uh, my trainer taught these things very interchangeable, and I, I bring it up because I am unable to teach hypnosis without bringing NLP into it because they are very meshed uh, in the way that I was trained, so I can't really separate them out. Um, but all of hypnosis is contained within NLP because it is one of the modalities they use. Um, are there any questions so far? I have a question about NLP. Yeah, go for it. I, uh, somebody told me something about NLP, and I didn't know whether they were kind of like it was bullshit or not, whether, or whether it was real NLP. And they're like, be careful using this four-word sentence. The first word is hurt, and the second word is people, and the third word is hurt, and the fourth word is people. And if you say that often enough, it comes off as your subliminal unconscious has two imperative commands. <laughs> and I was like, I'm vaguely familiar with NLP, and I'm like, are you saying everybody's always in a trance state all the time? Does it involve a trance state? Like, is this is this bullshit, or is it just like? Anything you hear on the news or on media or on like Chomsky saying you can't say the word troops or things like that, everybody is always in a trance state? Um, there is a degree to which some of these principles can be turned into superstition. Um, one, like one of the uh, things that people get all uptight about is using the word try. Like, oh, if you say try, like Yoda says, the do or do not, there is no try. If you tell people to try something, you're telling them to fail because trying isn't succeeding. And so people get all these superstitions about specific words. NLP isn't really about specific words. It's more about the patterns that you use with language and more specifically how you create your representational system. And right or wrong, the, the basic uh, sensory and cognitive premise of NLP is that there is a world out there we have senses that take in information. We take in way more information than we can consciously process because, you know, there's cool air coming from the vent that you may not have been consciously aware of until I brought it up. You may not be consciously aware of uh, the feeling of your tongue in your mouth until I mention it. There's many, many things that we are sensing but we are not consciously aware of so that your brain acts as a kind of a filter where things come into executive if they are Pro, you know, procedurally deemed important enough to warrant conscious attention. And the brain, the brain is an energy hog. Evolutionarily speaking, the brain requires so much energy that we have all these shorthands, which is why we develop habits. Because if you had to consciously think, if every time you came up to a door, you had to examine the doorknob, figure out what is the shape, what is the best position for my hand, how far, far do I need to turn it? If you had to be consciously processing that and everything else you do in a day all the time, it would be exhausting. It would, it would not be sustainable. So your brain has shortcuts, and many, many shortcuts. Anything that you do a couple times, you know, you, when you were a kid, you learned how to open a door, and now if you come to a door that's a different size, you don't stop to think about, well, this door's a different size. How am I gonna open it? Or if you're used to knobs and you come to one that's a handle, you don't stop and think, uh-oh, this is not a doorknob that I'm used to. You still reach out and you turn it. And it, it happens unconsciously. So many, many things that we do become habitualized and turned into a subconscious pattern that happens automatically. Mm -hmm. 
most most of the time. And you brought up trance. Do you don't you need to be in trance to do NLP? For one, um, special state model of hypnosis has been roundly debunked by uh, neuroscientists. Hypnosis does not create a there is no special state of the brain or brain waves called hypnosis or called trance. Um, but there are many different modes of processing. There are different brainwave frequencies, alpha, beta, beta, and all those. And so, obviously, first we need to define what hypnosis is, right? Did you, you ask? Did I answer your question about NLP? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so don't get superstitious about is, specific words. Like what it, instead of that, you're eventually going to end this talk and do okay. Well, what what are we going to do? And then I'll I guess okay. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll go a little bit on the NLP route, I'll go a little bit on the hypnosis route because we don't have a ton of time, so I'll find out what you guys want to focus on more. NLP, broadly speaking, has two modes. There is the meta model and the Milton model, which is named after Milton Erickson, who was a medical doctor and a hypnotist and did all these amazing, wonderful things with his clients and is probably considered the founder of conversational hypnosis, wherein you are not formally saying, look at my finger, but you're just talking to someone and getting them uh, to nod in agreement and to have that rapport, and that's uh, a form of hypnosis, so you've already uh, been there. But, <laughs> um, so the Milton model is all about that um, arranging, I should talk about the meta model first, sorry. The meta model is uh, breaking down your preconceptions, your frames, how you're representing the world to yourself. So there's a lot of questions about like, um, someone says like, I can't do anything right. Have you ever done one thing right? Think of something you have done right. Well, okay, I'm pretty good at playing piano. Okay, so it's not true that you can't do anything right. So what do you mean? And you get into these uh, very like dissolving questions to kind of break down people have to come in with a, a state or a belief that is demonstrably false and it's hindering them. Um, so you can break, use the meta model to kind of just break that down, get to the elements of it, and how would you rather be? What what do you you know? How would you rather feel if you're you know trying something and it's hard? Rather than saying to yourself you can't do anything right, how, how would you like to respond to that? And then we can put those bits and pieces back together to give you the belief that you can do many things right, or you can learn to do things right. One of one very easy thing is. Um, if, you, if you want to take one exercise from this workshop, the next time you find yourself saying, I can't do that, change it to, I don't know how to do that yet. And see, take a moment to see how that shifts your approach to whatever the thing is that you think you can't do. Right? So that's an example of how NLP works. You break things down to their elements, figure out what would be a better response, and restructure it. So that's the kind of tools that NLP offers. Um, and then, so the, the meta model is using those qu questions and examination to break down your um, your uh, attribution errors. And then the Milton model is directing your focus to bring those elements into a representation that will be more adaptive for you for whatever your goal is. That's NLP. Hypnosis, on the other hand, is the use of language and communication to direct attention, seed ideas, and uh, create an altered experience of reality, which is um, something that is useful in repatterning and re like when you have these subconscious programs. Um, you know, my uh, something broke in my house means I'm bad because I don't know how to fix things. You can uh, go into a trance that says like I'm in I, like. You know, if you're interested in learning, you can repattern yourself to think, if I find something broken, that's an opportunity for me to learn about that thing. And that can give you, uh, you know, more, more power, more choice, uh, more happiness, success, confidence, whatever it is you're looking for out of life. So I came here expecting to talk a little bit about hypnosis and NLP, and then um, lead some exercises to teach people how to do self-hypnosis. Sound good? Yeah. yeah. Sounds good. Cool. Any questions at this stage? No. Um, is, is NLP basically the same thing as cognitive reframing? Is that just like euphemistic or no? Uh, there's, there's a lot of different 
phrases that refer to similar ideas. I, I consider like hypnosis, NLP, CBT, reframing, um, even EMDR to an extent, acupuncture, Reiki, meditation are all different facets on this huge gem that has a principle of how the human mind works that we don't really know the thing, but we have a bunch of, and over time, increasingly better tools to get to that thing, right? What did you call, is it neural reprogramming? Well, you're talking about ketamine. You have this phrase. Oh, that's annealing. Like annealing. Neural annealing. Neural annealing, mm -hmm. yeah. QRI. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's not a different thing. I have not heard of that. Oh, the annealing is a different, it's a I metaphor know. where like the metal is heated and then when it cools, the smith has made it into a different configuration of atoms. But like your brain gets temperature rise from a psychedelic and then you like re-experience the trauma in a better and safer way, mm. and yeah. how it reconfigures into you're no longer activated by that. Yes, I, that's the meta pattern. I, I would say that that you don't need psychedelics for that. Like you can you can do like it on would psychedelics. It, yeah, true. So I just add is, would it be better sober? Actually, it's hard to say, but I will say that giving giving it the ability to dissociate within a a, a safe context gives me because it is so upsetting, like confronting things from your past, sometimes that's very difficult to handle. So Yeah, no, I get that. So, yeah. The, the neural annealing has three different modes. Uh -huh. It's like there's a cold fusion, which is through meditation. So you're deliberately building up free energy in the brain and not letting it leak out through familiar hot, uh, thought patterns. So eventually that energy builds up and can create new thoughts without needing to overload the brain. Psychedelics overload the brain, so it's like pouring in so much water that it can't leak out through the established thought pattern and it just builds up anyway. And then there's the artistic, shamanic, or rhythmic method of neural annealing, where you're in such an enjoyable trance state through art that the rhythmic patterns uh, self-plug, leaks, and get more gets poured in. If you have like a world-class magician or shaman who's like holding that, um, then it, it builds a more enjoyable track that then builds up again free energy in the brain that instead of dissipating through established thought patterns eventually it reaches the action potential to then rewrite like fox goes a river like so much goes in that now there's a clean pathway and the local maxima uh, has been avoided so you're, you're able to reach a higher uh, peak state anyway i just wanted to say yeah. that it's not just psychedelics it's also the rhythmic artistic method of shamanic trance, and it's also the meditation where you're plugging up your leaks. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, could, I could have a lot to say about that, but what I, the main point that I want to say is that you can do hypnosis content free, um, where you don't, you don't bring what you're working on into conscious awareness, and this is largely done through metaphor. Then metaphor is huge, huge in Ericksonian hypnosis, the way Milton Erickson did it. People didn't even know they were doing hypnosis. He would just be talking to you, asking questions, and then he would start telling a story that seemed to have no relevance whatsoever. Uh, like the time that I was, uh, you know, four years old, and I thought I was Spider-Man, so I got my mom's uh, knitted beret and I pulled it over my face because that to me suggested the webbing of Spider-Man. And I would climb up on the uh, refrigerator and leap off to my mom's horror, but I didn't get hurt because in my mind I was as powerful as Spider-Man and I had the strength of a spider and I couldn't get hurt and I didn't get hurt. Um, and so Milton Erickson would tell these stories and it would seed ideas into people's unconscious minds without them having to confront whatever it was that they needed to hear that story for. Does that answer your question? <laughs> What was that? I have, I exactly. I, I think I, I think oh, it was the, yeah. Does this have anything to do with neural annealing? Yes. I didn't think it did. But. Yeah. So, um, but I bring I bring that up because uh, hypnosis can be done content free, and uh, as on a side note, personally, I would find any memory way harder to deal with on psychedelics than sober. But that that may just be my experience. Because for me, psychedelics super intensify every experience, I think whether it's good or bad. Setting. Ketamine yeah, also is meant to produce a dissociative effect. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, it'll probably depend on the second you use it as well. Um, so anyhow, um, within the realm of hypnosis, I can talk about Ericksonian indirect hypnosis. There's also direct hypnosis, which people um, are probably more familiar with in a, in a colloquial sense, wherein 
Uh, we don't do a swinging of the watch, but we might do stare at my finger or stare at my hand, and I am going to give you positive affirmations about how you're going to be after even just this short exercise where you don't even think you're in the trance you are in yet at, that will unlock subconscious pathways that will increase your confidence, increase your positivity, and increase your inherent ability to gain all of the things that you want to gain from this conference and be very open to the learnings of not only this workshop, but everyone you hear and interact with for this the duration of the event. And that's all you need to do right away now. How's everybody feel? So that you were giving really conscious <laughs> suggestions. You were giving explicit suggestions. That was that, that was direct. Yes. Yeah, so when I was when I was telling a, a, a story, that was metaphor, and you don't know consciously. I don't even. I don't either. Yeah. I just give you something that your your patterns can get from it what they need, and in direct, it's that you know. Um, and direct would, statement of what is going to happen. And would guided meditation fall into this as well? Like imagine you know that you're. And relaxing and there's suggestions mixed in with the uh, provisionally yes uh, in that a guided hypnosis it would depend on specifically what the guide is uh, guiding you into but if at any point you feel that like something different is happening that takes into the realm of hypnosis mm -hmm. if I'm just like Oh, relax and imagine you're on the beach and you feel really good. I guess that could be considered hypnosis. But if you're just like, oh yeah, I'm relaxed. I'm, I'm, I'm relaxing and I like the way it feels. There's no where, where it gets into hypnosis is, um, you know, if, if, well, yeah, everybody relax. Lean back and imagine you're on the beach. Hands not touching if you would. And imagine you're on the beach somewhere. Imagine your favorite beach whether you've been there or not, and just notice what you can notice at this beach. You may hear some sounds. You may feel the temperature of the air. There may be people there or not, but if there are, they're not going to pay any attention to you, and you don't need to pay any attention to them. And in a moment, you're going to feel an unusual but pleasurable sensation, and it will be different for each one of you. For some of you, it might feel like you're floating on a cloud. For some of you, it might feel like you're sinking deeper into your chair. For some of you, it might feel that there is an energy or a warmth growing and circulating in your body. But whatever that experience is for you, you will feel it much more and more in the next moments now. And notice how that feels and enjoy that sensation as it brings you better mind-body harmony, better connections of your conscious and your unconscious mind to further unlock the things that we spoke about. Better receptivity, more inspiration, more learning from this event and from many things that will happen to you in the coming days and weeks because you allowed yourself to have this experience. Now, in a moment I'll count to three. On three, everyone will open their eyes, feel wide awake, refreshed, and notice how good you feel. One, coming back to the surface. Two, to the here and now. Three, back in the Motown room. How do you feel? Does anybody want to comment on what they experienced? So, uh, admittedly, I was like kind of distracted in my head. Like I've had other thoughts, you know, the last few hours, and like, you know, preparing for things, like, all this, all this distraction, right? Uh, and I was like, damn, like I want to be receptive, right? I want to be engaged, and like, um, and anyway, so like as we were telling the story of the beach, I didn't even like really process all this stuff, right? It was like, oh yeah, I guess I'm on a beach somewhere. Which beach is it? Oh, I forget it. Like, um, I feel like I wasn't actually like in the moment with it, and yet. When you did the countdown, you're like, you're gonna feel something. It'll be different for each of you. And I was like, all right, I'm doing this, just, you know, whatever. So wrong. It, just, it won't work for me. <laughs> um, and as soon as you snapped or uh, forget how you did it, immediately I felt something right here. Uh -huh. And I was like, oh yes, that that was actually there before. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> um, you know, so I've, that's been part of my experience this whole time, but like all of a sudden, uh, yeah, I just like got focused there and got to like enjoy that part. Yeah, that yeah. And, um, yeah, and I, I did feel like a bunch of things reconfigured, so. Fascinating. Yeah, so, uh, so the point with hypnosis is to feel um, that something is happening, something not under your control, um, but that will be beneficial. Typically we want it to be beneficial. It could be, I suppose, evil hypnosis. Well, it really couldn't be because um, the one thing that will uh, keep you out of that flow is fear. Um, if you're afraid of what the hypnotist might do, if you're afraid of like, you know, the, a trance state, trance state, whatever that is, um, fear will really interfere with that. So one of the things that hypnotists must do first is to, um, to kind of demystify it and give you the idea that it's fun, safe, and enjoyable, which it is. So what, what is that state? Like how is it? How is it gone into? And, and what is it about? Us? Okay, so many many people in the hypnosis field will say that uh, trance is we're always in some type of trance. Um, trance is just whatever mode of processing you're in at the time, and they do change. For instance, when you're hanging out with your friends, you have a different flow than when you're at work talking to someone that you're responsible to, right? Or like, you, you see this like night and day with police. Police can be like leaning and like chit-chatting and like joking around, and then they hear a sound, and they're, you know, at attention, ready to resp like in a flip of a switch, they're in a completely different mode, and they're no longer thinking about the joke or that was funny or it's everything is focus, right? So um, hypnosis is about just changing that focus, and for us, uh, so a lot of times when you watch a, a, a TV, TV or a movie, right, you feel the emotions of the story, you get absorbed into that. A lot of times when you recall a movie, you recall the people as though they were there. You don't recall a picture uh, surrounded by a screen with your wall. You recall the characters, right? And, uh, and you, you get emotionally absorbed into the story. You know intellectually those are actors, this isn't happening, um, but you, you just get absorbed into the experience. And that have the, and uh, you know, We've probably most of us have heard of the flow state when you get into a creative mode that you know you're you're doing something and, and, and you're really focused on creating and you know you you snap out of it right and you're like oh my god I've been doing that for three hours it seemed like ten minutes because I was just so in the zone right in the zone is code for trance um, or if you you know you go you drop go to drive somewhere somewhere you've been a thousand times you get in the car you're thinking about other things, you get to where you're going, like, oh, I'm here already. I didn't really, I wasn't really paying attention because my unconscious mind was driving because you know the route so well. Or I went to the place I'm used to going instead of the place I actually yes. set up to go to. Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, that, yes. That, well, that's, that's also an example of um, the, the little shorthand patterns that get programmed. Uh, like, I remember one time I had to blow my nose and I went to the shelves where the tissue box usually was but for whatever reason, there was a tape dispenser there instead. And before I realized what I was doing, I was taking off a piece of tape and like <laughs> putting it on my nose. Because I had the program of, I'm going to get a thing to wipe my nose. But then when I saw it, like, I wasn't consciously aware, but I saw the tape dispenser. So it combined with the program of, like, when you go to a tape dispenser, you don't think, oh, like, okay, I need to grab it here. And I need to pull it a certain amount. You just do it without thinking. I reached out, I took off a piece of tape. And I still had the program of I'm going to wipe my nose. And it was like, there's, now there's tape on my nose. And it all happened without my conscious involvement. But yes, the, these are all examples of trance. Uh, you know, right now we're in the having fun in a, in a circle trance, where we're in a different mode than we would be if we were the one presenting, or if we were playing a game, or if we were at work, or dr even driving. We're always in some type of trance. So. It, with self-hypnosis, if we're going to start going into that realm, um, self-hypnosis can be difficult because 
when you are, when you are undergoing the experience, and you're, I, I'm really glad you shared your experience, Blake. Is it yes? I'm really glad you shared your experience because you had that thing where you were experiencing, but you were also observing it and observing it critically. Like I'm not really doing this right, and oh, like what's going to happen? But something happened anyway, and it's kind of this juxtaposition. If you are doing self hypnosis, now you're getting into. I am experiencing this, I'm also critically watching this, and I'm also the one attempting to direct it, and it's too much to maintain. So, although there are many people who will teach self-hypnosis as, I'm gonna sit in a chair, and I'm going to tell myself what to do, and I'm going to recite affirmations once I'm in trance, I don't think that's an effective way to do it. Um, the much more effective way to do it is to set an intention, guide yourself into trance, and trust that the work will happen. Um, because your unconscious mind knows why you're there. And, and you're, I should define, your unconscious mind is just every part of your neural network that you are is not an executive right now, whatever you're not paying attention to. Your entire body of knowledge, your skills, your language, your memories, you know, all of that, and like processes, you know, uh, beating your heart. You don't need to think about that. That just happens. But it's, there's a part of your brain that's doing that. Um, breathing is kind of in the middle because it's not you're not paying attention to it until I bring it up and now you're aware of it. And you can control it, but when you lose conscious awareness of it, that just starts goes back to autopilot, right? Um, so if you are going to sit down and I'm going to do a self-hypnosis session for such and such a purpose, your whole mind already knows why you're doing it. You don't have to sit there and think, uh, you know, I am going to be more confident when I give my presentation. I'm going to be more confident. I'm going to speak with authority. You don't have to say that because, in, in a way, that's a little pedantic. Because we, you know, as a, in the executive, we always think that we're the one in charge. Um, but the rest of your mind is ju just as much part of you as the part that's executive. So the method that I teach and the method that uh, actually Milton Erickson's wife uh, taught after his death is where you set an intention, you go into trance, and you can either trust the work to happen, which is a great way to do it. You can set a timer if that's your style. You can also set up an isomotor signal, uh, and I'll, I'll break that isomotor signal is when you have some body movement or sensation that seems to arise spontaneously without your involvement. Um, and I'll, I will give an example of all of these methods. Are there any questions at this stage? Now, what do we set as our intention uh, is a question that you might ask yourself and probably are asking yourself now that I brought it up. How to create a cult. <clears throat> if you not create a cult. <laughs> Just kidding. If you wanted to, be a, if you wanted to be a better cult leader, <laughs> self-hypnosis could definitely help you to do that. Um, if you wanted to be um, have more confidence, even if it's in a certain area. I'm very confident with my professional skills, but I'm not so confident when I'm playing guitar in front of people. It's my hobby and, you know, you could have confidence for a specific purpose. You could have a, a general, I'm going to have uh, more positive sentiment and well -be feelings of well-being. Um, you can set a specific purpose, you can set a general purpose. You can even, and what I do occasionally, is um, trust to the unconscious mind to know what would be a good intention. And like, I'm just gonna go into a trance and let my unconscious mind do some work without my uh, interfering, and let's do something good together. So there's, there's, these are any, any number of intentions that you can set. Once you set your intention, uh, before we go into the method, I would like everyone, anyone who wishes to participate is welcome to uh, clasp your hands together just like so, with your hands about a foot in front of your face, um, and press those palms together, hold them up, stare at those hands. Don't do anything yet, but in a moment I'm going to ask you to extend your index fingers pointing up to the roof, to the ceiling, about an inch apart. And when you do, don't do it yet, just keep those fingers uh, crossed for now. 
But when you point those fingers up, those fingertips are going to feel magnetized, like there's an invisible force pulling them together. I don't want you to just put them together to make me happy, but don't fight it too much either. The point is for you to feel that sensation as you go ahead and extend those index fingers now parallel, pointing at the ceiling, and notice that space getting smaller as those fingers feel magnetized and they start going together. The closer they get, the stronger those magnets get. And when those fingertips touch, you can go ahead and press them together. Watch that space get smaller and smaller. And just press those fingertips together. Imagine someone you love dearly. Stare at those fingers. Imagine someone you love dearly. If you want to imagine more than one, you can imagine more than one. Imagine the smiles on their faces. Imagine their laughter when they're with you. Imagine that love sticking those fingers together so tight that I wouldn't be able to pull them apart if I came and tried. Imagine that love sticking those fingers together so tight that you couldn't even pull them apart. Even if you try, you find they stick together even more. You can try and pull those fingers apart and find they stick even more. The harder you try, the tighter they stick. Until I say the word, I'll say the word release and I'll open. Release. Open those fingers. <laughs> Clear, open them now. Good job. Wide awake. How'd you do? How'd everybody do? I definitely felt the magnetism mm -hmm. immediately. Like it was only a few seconds of as you were speaking. Uh -huh. I was like, oh, more. <laughs> Who got stuck? Mine were stuck together, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I could, yeah, I could not pull them I didn't apart. see, I, I honestly didn't see anybody pull them apart. Maybe you were just playing along, I, but I didn't. No, I, I didn't. told you not to, right? Yeah, so. Um, that is an example of the enormous power of your unconscious mind. Because all I did was suggest that this was going to happen. I set you up into this focus. I directed your focus. I directed your attention. I seeded the idea. And your unconscious mind made it happen. It's really that easy. So the methods for self-hypnosis. Um, what should I start with? I'll start with the, uh, Betty Erickson, my take on the Betty Erickson method. Um, we're going to do one, two, three, three, two, one. I want you to notice right now one sensation external. Maybe the feeling of the chair supporting your weight, maybe your feet in your shoes, or whatever sensation you notice right now. Don't close your eyes until I invite you to. Um, I want you to notice that one thing, and while you're still noticing that one sensation, I want you to notice two sounds that you can hear. You can count the sound of my voice if you want to. You can count the um, ventilation system or maybe the creaking of a chair um, or the noise coming from upstairs. Notice two sounds that you can notice right now outside in, in the environment. And then take a notice for three things that you can see in this room or around this environment. Three specific things take note of. And once you have noticed the sensation, the two sounds, and the three visual items, go ahead and close those eyes. And I want you to imagine yourself in a new scene, a beautiful scene, a scene of your creation, of your choice. Imagine yourself in a beautiful place. And I want you to notice three things that could be seen there. don't know, just make them up. This is your place. You have ultimate power here. And you can create the scene that is just to your liking. And notice three things that can be seen there. While you're in this place, you might notice the quality of the lighting, the temperature of the air. But I want you to take special notice of two things you could hear in this environment. Imagine those two sounds, maybe continuous, maybe intermittent, two things in this internal landscape that you can hear. And then I want you to imagine internally one good sensation. And as you notice that one good sensation inside your body, simply notice how it feels, where in your body you feel it most. And as you notice that sensation, I want you to pay close attention to whether that sensation is moving, intensifying, or whether you're getting more aware of it, or some combination of these. 
And as you notice it more, and as it intensifies, it can begin to move and spread. And just let that happen now. And let that good feeling spread throughout your body, circulating, flowing, giving you a really good sensation that can grow and deepen. And there's no demands on you right now. There's nothing you need to do except have this experience and enjoy this experience. Really allow yourself to enjoy this moment in this place that's just for you, that facilitates the unlocking of doors, the breaking of barriers, and the accomplishment of the purpose for which you entered into this experience, whether you are consciously aware of it or not. And in a moment, I'm going to count to three. On three, we will open our eyes, wide awake, refreshed, knowing the work has begun and will be finished soon. One, coming back to the surface. Two, to the here and now. Three, eyes open. How do you feel? Very relaxed. Very relaxed. Anybody else got a comment? Hard to talk. Hard to talk. Uh, kind of like a needle feeling feel in my hands, extending up through my through my wrists. Is it pleasurable? Uh, not pins and needles. It's more like tingling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tingling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have no feeling in my hands. So yeah. I can feel that they're touching. Are you okay with that? Yeah. I mean, Great. I can feel it a little bit more now, but yeah. It was actually I had a similar experience when I did breath work. Yeah. Yeah, breath, breath is huge on changing state as well. Um, so what I did there, to recap, okay, I started with one thing you could feel. Ex you start, you, the, the first one, two, three is everything's external. The second, three, two, one is everything internal. So I started with one thing you can feel, two things you can hear, three things you can see. Uh, and this is, this is a self-hypnosis method, if I didn't make that clear, that you can go forth in your life Next week, next month, next year, 10 years from now, this is yours forever. No one can ever take it away from you. Uh, if you have a need, I want to be more confident. I need to learn this material quickly. Uh, whatever your um, realm of the mind goal is, you can use this method. One thing you can feel, one thing you, two things you can hear, three things you can see. Close eyes. Imagine yourself in any scene. You can go anywhere you want. You can go to Morocco, you can go to Mars, you can go to uh, Middle Earth, wh whatever you like. Go anywhere and just notice in that internal environment three things that you can see, two things that you can hear, and then that one good sensation inside your body. Let it grow and flow. You can either set a timer, as I said. Uh, you can do 10 minutes, 15 minutes, something like that. Or you can also do this at night going to sleep, and instead of I'm going to do this for a period of time and then come out, you can say I'm going to do this for a period of time for this purpose and then drift into a lovely sleep and go to sleep. Um, and you can also, one of my favorite methods is wait for the aha. I am going to go into this state, I'm going to enjoy this state until at some point I will get that aha, my eyes will open and I will just know that it's done. And maybe it will be two minutes, maybe it will be 17 minutes. Um, but at some point, if I, if I pre-frame that for myself, I'm going to go into this experience until I get that aha moment. Uh, the time will inevitably come that I, I feel it. I'm like, oh, OK, I'm done, great. I'm going to say, you've only got five minutes left, so. Oh my god! Oh, well, let me, let me defer to the floor, because I, a different kind of ritual that is basically trance state has been happening to me the last, like, week and a half, and I wanted to see if it would count as trance or hypnosis. I, I want to understand that. We can talk Let's talk about that offline afterwards. Thank you so much. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, 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 I, I just wanted to be here for one of your sessions, and I know why now. Great, great. Um, thank you. Uh, anybody have any questions about that? 
I should have done a handout for that, and I can cr create after the fact. Yeah, I, would, yeah. Yeah. I, would, I would absolutely love it. I would love to be linked up so what I know on the Discord, and then yeah. from you each session, I'm, people are adding their materials that, that are then linked to and posted on the Oh, great. Board. Yeah, let's do oh, that. Okay. I don't know if that. this is a question, but having done grounding work before, thanks to dissociation, um, and coming back into your body, that's one of the things that you do is, is the first portion of that. Mm -hmm. is coming back into your senses. Um, you know, what do you see? What do you hear? What do you smell? Yeah. You know, what do you feel? Sure. Kind of well, that's, all, that's yeah. also, um, uh, not specifically that, but a similar technique is what I call one minute mindfulness. <laughs> um, which maybe I'll do that since we don't have, I was gonna do an automotor thing, but I don't think we have time for that now. Um, maybe I'll do it offline if people are interested. Um, but there's a great, um, mindfulness exercise that if you hook yourself up to an EEG, um, you can do in one minute what like 30 minutes of sitting meditation will do to your brain waves. Wow. That's so cool. I wanted so bad to have an EEG here, both last year and this year, and I don't I don't know if people are able to like put things out into the world and make them happen, but I want to tell everyone that if there's some way to get an EEG there are relatively inexpensive ones now, and I actually like hypnosis teachers will talk about that. Okay. Um, Chase Hughes is one who was a uh, actually a naval intelligence uh, interrogator who now in his civilian life does behavior change, uh -huh. and he recommends have all the tools. Have like if you're gonna if you're gonna tell people yes. you're changing their state, put a pulse ox on them, put an EEG on them, let them see. Well, this is the, that was like the the neurofeedback thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's like. You can have this experience, and you can like, you know, qualitatively know. Oh, I'm having experience. But when you see it on a machine, it takes on That's a, what a, a, a special does. authority, right? How, how much are, are those? Are you familiar with yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's amazing. That I should yeah. Have one. Yeah. 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 So I real, one real quick, I want to teach you the one minute mindfulness. If everyone can uh, yeah. turn to face the wall, and if you want to continue wall. facing that wall, that's fine too. Uh, just uh, put your feet flat on the floor, hands in your lap, not touching. You can actually do this anywhere, anytime. No one will even know you're doing anything. You don't have to be sitting. You can be standing. You can be wherever you are. But just pick a spot on the wall to gaze at, to fix your eyes at. And whatever else I invite you to do during this exercise, keep your eyes fixed on that one spot that you've chosen. And simply notice that spot. Focus in on that spot. And I want you to just notice what's right around that spot. Without moving your eyes, just your attention. Notice what it looks like around that spot. And as you continue to breathe rhythmically and naturally, widen it out a little bit. Notice what, what's around that area that you were noticing. Keeping your eyes fixed in the center. Allow your awareness to go out incrementally in concentric circles. A few seconds at a time, a little wider now. And then notice what's around that. Notice what's around that. And continue widening your limit of attention all the way out to the periphery of your vision. So with your eyes still fixed in the center, you are now noticing what is at the periphery of your vision in both directions. I wish we had an EEG machine right now because we would see that we have all gone into an open focus state, which I think is beta. Not quite as deep as theta, but a little bit lower than a normal uh, goal-oriented object. And you can break whenever you like. And, uh, no, and that takes now much... That you've, you've mentioned that, I realize that I think I'm usually in an open focus state, but we're pretty near it. Great, and that, that it was really, really hard for me to actually not at the beginning, so that I could expand that out. And I was like, we're Oops. already expanded out. I, I could go to the start of the racetrack. I'm yeah, at the well, end line. If it, if because the, the more you like, so the more you do self hypnosis, the more you do any kind of hypnosis, the more you do exercises like that, the more you meditate, you get better at it. Because you're you're reinforcing those neural pathways, and the more like, and so you have synaptic pruning where you sleep, and then your you know your myelin changes around your neurons, and those 
pathways become much easier. What once you've had a, a chain event of of neuronal response, it gets easier for that to happen the next time. If this neuron fires and this neuron fires in response, it's going to be much ready, much more ready, even if the stimulus is not as much to fire in that path, and it gets easier and easier. Which is how habits form. Um, so. Teaching that exercise takes way longer than it, than it really does because I think we probably did maybe a minute, a minute and a half, but you can, you can do that in 20 seconds if you want to. If I'm, I'm about to go on for a show or a presentation and I feel myself a little agitated, I'll just look at the wall, take a nice deep breath, and zoom out, and okay, I'm totally ready to perform, you know, I'm ready to go out and present, I'm cool and collected. Can I give you a copy of... Uh, Charlie Aubrey's book, Open and Awareness, that's David, David Chapman's partner. Yeah. Their, their Vajrayana method is about having open, as open an awareness as possible. And if you try that, and then it cohered with all those other things you're talking about, I'd love to learn how all those things fit together. Yeah, well, that's another example of, like I was saying about the, the gem. There's this, this gem that has consciousness inside it, and there's all these facets. There's, there's Vajrayana. There's meta rationality. There's hypnosis. There's Reiki. There's acupuncture. Which, no offense to acupuncturists, but I think it is much more along the lines of conscious awareness than anything physiological, in my opinion. Um, but these are all facets that get us approaching that the, the, the biggest mystery I know of. Oh my God. Okay. So that was just an interesting oh, question because I can't remember whether it was. Was it Jade or somebody who was asking, hey, do you want to figure out what Charlie Alfred and David Chapman are talking about when saying that, you know, that, that thoughts are luminous, clear, transparent jewels? And as soon as you said that, I'm like, you know, they've never been able to explain it to me. And as soon as you said that, I'm like, oh, well, that's an idea about what the ice actually might be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, all right. Well, thank you, everybody, so much. Thank you.